very uh, honored to, to introduce Rami uh, Crispin from Apple. Going to talk to us about uh, time series analysis today. Uh, before his talk, a few announcements. So I'm also very excited that uh, Rami is going to come back to South Dakota in February of uh, for the Data Science Symposium. He's going to give us keynote speech. Um, and also, uh, Rami, you're going to run a, a workshop. We haven't decided on what kind of workshop we're going to run. Um, but yeah, workshop is much longer, two, three hours. I think sometimes even around four hours. Um, the last announcement is next week, Data Science Club. We're going to have uh, Ryan Burton, uh, who is the senior vice president for uh, vice president for analytics at Capital Services. He's going to come here physically in this room to talk to us. So that's not, not next week, two weeks from now, the last meeting of, of today. Um, thank you very much, Remy. Uh, it's all yours, thanks. Thank you so much for hosting me. Um, We're good. Okay, cool. All right, so um, thank you so much for uh, hosting me. I'm always excited to talk about forecasting. Um, one of the most interesting topic in forecasting is the scaling aspect. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before getting started, just a quick intro. I'm a data science and engineering manager. I am mainly focused on forecasting, um, MLOps. Those are the two items that I enjoy most to do. I am open source contributor. I'm mainly doing R, but recently I also started to do some uh, open source stuff with Python. And I am author of a book about time series. Currently work on uh, two other books related to time series and Docker. Um, I just will, um, before continuing, will mention that everything uh, that we are presenting today is not related to my work at Apple. Uh, so without further ado, let's talk about the agenda for today. Um, we're going to talk about, um, we start with talking about what is forecasting, like what is the forecasting process and how traditionally you would forecast a single time series and the downside of this process. Um, and then we talk about different approaches for scaling. And we talk about the horse racing. Uh, we're going to talk about how to analyze multiple time series uh, and some approach for transfer learning. And last but not least, we're going to talk about monitoring uh, time series data. So let's start with the, how would you forecast a single time series? So the traditional approach, uh, typically in the business, uh, world, you start with some business objective, you try to solve something uh, that require applying some forecasting task. Um, so let's say, take this time series, let's say that you're working at the Bureau of Energy and you are looking at the demand for natural gas for residual consumptions in the US and you want to uh, predict what would be the consumption in the next five years because it's involved of infrastructure that you need uh, to support it and other, uh, there is pricing and other objectives that I would assume if you, I would do uh, this type of forecasting. Um, but that's like a, you know, the problem, you have a single time series. So you, the first thing you start is getting the data. You will call some API, pull the data or database and the next step is start to analyze the data. I'm trying to figure out what are the characteristics of this time series, uh, what features you will require, what type of approach you want to use. So you will use different uh, visualization and tools for analyze time series. In this example, this is a decomposition of um, time series with the STL model. Um, trying to see what patterns I can see, the seasonality in the trend and so on, uh, check correlation. And then based on this process, I can go to the modeling, um, will try maybe multiple time series uh, data uh, models 
compare the, the results, will evaluate uh, the performance of those uh, models. And you know, this is a process where you can identify uh, improvement that you can apply based on the performance, uh, look at the residuals and so on. So it's a process that uh, you will have a feedback, go back to the modeling until you get to the steady state of the process. And from there, if you're happy, um, after checking residuals and so on, you will generate a forecast. So that's a, a very manual process. Um, that's how I start when I start with time series data. Um, but today, you know, typically you won't necessarily forecast a single time series data. And if you have two time series uh, to forecast, so you can do the same. But if you have 200, this is where it's going to be very painful. Um, and you cannot really scale it unless you are really using your time um, not efficient, efficiently and, and do the same process for each year. Um, so let's talk about scaling. And I think we should start with the definition. And then again, like that's my definition in my own words and not necessarily a uh, textbook definition, but scaling uh, forecasting is defining, I think, the level of effort of adding additional series. It should be nonlinear. So you typically will spend most of your time on set the settings, but adding um, more series to the forecast process is less uh, time consuming. And that's what they have, like the margin is decaying of adding more series. So it's a uh, scalable. It's a function of a forecasting approach. Like, so we, the previous slide talked about the regular uh, forecasting approach, which won't work in a case that you have hundreds of time series. So there is the approach that we're going to talk uh, after on the next slides. And uh, part of it, you're going to have some dependency on infrastructure because it might be uh, require some compute resources. Um, so you need to be equipped accordingly. And this is the trade-off when you're going to scale, it's come with the cost of potential uh, lower accuracy. Uh, and I will talk about a little bit more in some of the examples, but essentially you cannot win it all. Um, so that's a trade-off and that's something that, uh, again, like the question between scaling and accuracy, there should be some, um, you know, well, uh, and in line of the business ob objectives, uh, where you kind of like put your effort. And today I'm going to talk about three approaches and, um, the last one is more about how to mitigate risk. So um, we'll start talking about all stressing. That's my favorite uh, approach for time series forecasting. Um, and then we see about how to analyze uh, hundreds of series with a cluster uh, analysis or unsupervised approach. And then we are going to talk about transfer learning. Uh, I will just pause, I uh, will say if there are any questions, um, uh, feel free to stop me and ask. Um, I don't see the chat, so I know I've, uh, you can, I will leave time at the end, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to stop right. and pause. And I'm, I'm more in her the chat, uh, Rami. Awesome, cool. So just let me know. So those are the main, there are, there are definitely more I decided to start with a simplistic approach that uh, I wasn't sure the level of experience, but I, I assumed that um, that uh, uh, given that it's university, so um, people people might not have a previous experience with uh, forecasting. So starting from very simplistic, that easy to understand. Uh, so let's talk about all stressing. And the idea in all stressing that, as it sounds, you are taking multiple models and you run a, a racing between those models. Um, 
In this example that you see here, we're taking a time series data. We will split it. We use the backtesting as a training approach. We will split the data into multiple training and testing partition, which is the equivalent for a cross validation in machine learning. And we will train on each training partition uh, each of those models and evaluate the performance on the corresponding testing partition. The main difference between this and uh, cross validation that the split of the partition is not random uh, because it's a time series. But essentially, the idea is the same. And then we just move the window. And you can see that each time we predict the next testing partition, we then collect the uh, prediction and evaluate the performance. Uh, we define some um, metrics that we perform some metrics we want to measure, and there are many. In this case here, you see mean absolute percentage error, but there are, it's not limited to this. And what we want to see, it's a, the idea of uh, using the backtesting on a multiple testing partitions that we want to see first if the model is consistent in the performance. So as you can see in the box box plot here on the right side, the um, model ARIMA1, uh, I know if I, have, I cannot use my mouse, uh, but model ARIMA1 is the middle, is actually very consistent, but it has a high error rate. So that's not really a good model. Uh, and then you have the old winter, which is a little bit wider, but on average, it's the best performing model. So it's give us indication of what we should expect in terms of error rates on the actual forecast. Uh, and using this approach, you can actually use some generic models and apply it on dozens or hundreds and so on of series uh, and then score. And essentially, you can apply some rule that I want to take, in this case, the first, uh, the model that performed best on the testing partitions as my, my actual forecast. You can do other stuff. For example, you can say, I, I'm going to take the first three models and run some ensembling between those models. And again, it's the, the different uh, strategies to mitigate risk. But you, know, you can go as wild as you want. And, and be creative and build some strategy, but it's enable you to scale. And again, this approach might come with some pitfall. Uh, nothing is perfect. Um, the idea is, is very similar to AutoML. You're running some different approach, uh, different flavors of the same model, different features, and you are trying to get the one that performed best and with the op that it will be consistent also in the actual forecast. It will work when you have a well-structured data, like the uh, gas example, uh, natural the consumption of natural gas, where the patterns are very clear uh, and you uh, the, the structure is not really changed often. Right? You can assume that when in consumption of electricity or gas, Typically, uh, you know, people will use more on the winter, less on the summer, and that's kind of like a, uh, the effect of the weather. Um, it will work less uh, with unstructured data. It cannot learn uh, about from the past necessarily about future changes in the data if you have often changes. And a good example is the... Uh, what we saw, for example, in airlines after the COVID-19 impact. Um, so learning from the past won't really help you to understand the future because there is a new, the historical data don't necessarily represent the future. And then there are other approaches for modeling it, but then this is where the automation with the uh, force racing won't really work. The other, in the context of the COVID-19 example, um, when using backtesting, when you have changes on the last partition, uh, testing partition, you won't be able to uh, reflect it in the training partitions. What does it mean? 
Um, let's say that you are running six partitions. And in the last partition was reflecting, let's say, the first three months of the COVID. And you, if you remember, it was a big impact on transportation or on a, a unemployment. Um, on average, you will get that the model perform well because it was trained on the other, you know, five uh, testing uh, partition and may fail on the last. And in average, you get some result, but it's not really telling you if the model can handle those changes. And this is if this is your goal, then it might not work well. So those are things to think about. There is no one solution for all the cases, but that requires some understanding of your data. The next approach. Wait, uh, I'm very curious. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. I'm, I'm actually very, very curious. So how does it, how does exactly address the forecasting at scale though? Because you still have to run all the approaches you have um, to every single uh, time series. Yes. Right? Yeah, so you think about it's a way to automate the forecast. Um, going back here, um, let's say that you want now taking the um, natural gas consumption Let's say that you want now to forecast on the state level. You have 50 series. Um, so you create a, a bunch of uh, different modeling approach uh, based on the knowledge that you have on the data. Um, you know, you, you can assume that all of them has strong seasonality. It's a monthly data. Uh, there is a low trend. Uh, so we can play with a simplistic statistical model such as old winter or RIMA or linear regression and run tests, uh, retrain for each, each uh, um, series, individual series, apply those models, see which one of those models that in this case we are running five models, which one perform best on the testing partition and use this to the first model to forecast the actual data. So you will have going to have a, it's going to be, and that's another pitfall of this approach, it's going to be even compute. So in this case, we, are, we have six partitions, think that about that you have 50 series. So you need to, for each series to calculate six time training and testing, it multiplied by, by 50, you're going to have 300 uh, series. And some of those models might be Ion compute, for example, I'm using here uh, Auto Arima, uh, which is by itself like running its own grid search, and it could take a uh, few minutes through each each model to train. Um, so it could be something that you need to take into account that this process also have in compute. Yeah, I was I, wondering I, if we sorry, I just a follow up question. I was wondering if if we actually would be useful to consider some of the models actually perform worse than the other for a particular time series or a particular group of time series, right? And uh, for example, now you have, you're trying uh, six different models and uh, test on these partitions. Maybe eventually you can look at uh, all these different models and see whether or not you can cluster them into different groups. Exactly. You can do it, and I'm going to talk about it in, in I think it's the next next slide, talking about clusters. Fantastic, fantastic, yeah. Uh, Rami, Rami, just yeah. one quick, quick question. Uh, we do have some undergraduate here. Could you spend, uh, see a few sentences about each one of the models you have there on the screen? Yes, of course. Um, so here, in this, in this case, um, I'm using um, uh, ETS. ETS is stand for error trend and um, seasonality, which is essentially a model, statistical model that it is conceptually the same as, or similar to old winters exponential smoothing that calculate um, the weight of uh, the series. Like maybe take one step back. A time series typically would have uh, go. Okay, 
Uh, time series will, if you look at this uh, plot of those four, like uh, the decomposition of this uh, series on the, the blue one represents the actual. Then typically we break down a series to its trend and the seasonal components. So those are the structural components of a series. You would assume that most of the series would come with those. That. Could you try again? So series zero. Let me turn I off. Get that. Um, so each series would you would uh, typically would look at those components, and the red line represents the reminder. Um, if the seasonal and the trend component are kind of like the main uh, patterns representing the main patterns in data, you would expect that the reminder will be white noise, meaning like a non-correlated. Uh, um serious if the seasonal component and the trend does not reflect for example let's say that you have some uh outliers or uh, some structural break that might not be reflected on those two components you will see in the reminder um that some pattern left essentially the reminder give us indication if we should look at more patterns in the data so the ETS essentially in the old winter and most of those models essentially um, model the trend and the seasonal component and the error term and combine them together to and calculate each and then you add all of them and you get a forecast. I know it might sound a little bit uh, complicated, but think about as a uh, additive approach, you're just break down the components, calculate, predict each one separately, and edit back. So that's uh, essentially how old winter and um, uh, ETS models are working. They are coming from the same family of models, more or less. Um, Arima is a little bit different. Arima is uh, looking at uh, its regression between the series and its legs. Uh, the assumption, think about in time series, there is correlation between the series and it's like, so think about, if you think about the weather, the temperature an hour ago is very close to the temperature now. We're assuming that, you know, there won't be, unless you are in a really extreme weather, that the, the change, the marginal change will be fairly close. So you can regress the temperature with a, a leg of previous hour uh, to identify this relationship and carry it forward to predict the future. Um, probably there is a better way to explain, but essentially that's kind of like how Arima is working. And regression is where you have more flexibility, like the TSLM is then from time series linear regression, where you would take the series component again, like the trend, and the seasonal component will break, you will create feature. And this is where you are, you have more freedom to generate uh, it's a, a features using feature engineering approach and run it, regress it against the actuals and find out the relationship. And essentially, if you think about the trend is very simple to model, it's, you can express it as the marginal change of moving on time. So if you take, if you regress a time series which with is indexed, uh, that's kind of like modeling the trend. And you know, like the, the marginal change of moving from one unit of time to another. Similarly, you can generate the features if you are taking, you create like a factor for the month. In this case, it's monthly. You want to understand what is the weight of January? What is the weight of uh, February? And then you add it back, like in a recursion fashion. I hope this is, uh, answer the question. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. I didn't get that. Could you try again? And again, Siri, on my other computer. Sorry, I can't do that. You're not listening to iTunes. <laughs> um, um, can I ask a quick question here? Um, yeah. uh, if I may. Hi, this is Arnab. Um, two, two or three questions. Um, if you have multiple time series, is there, I mean, because I come from a retail background, um, I, complementarity uh, is that a thing between let's say you have uh, five 
products or 10 products and you're trying to understand because sale in one is going to because it there's always a limit to what the users can buy right there are macro factors and whatnot so that's mm-hmm. one question and the other question is um i mean it, another question is uh policy changes right uh if uh, new york or california uh, is enforcing a bunch of uh, uh, regulations on um, the greening the system, converting to 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 less electric. Um, is that sort of can, can, could that be captured by some smoothening approach? That you know what gradually the the demand is being smoothened out. And the the last bit is is there some network science element to this? Meaning, if you are modeling a grid. Um, is is there some network backbone that might constrain uh, the 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 however much there might be demand there can be a, a supply shock too right uh, so those are the three questions that I have yeah and I think those questions are uh, so let me start with the first one um, you asking if you have if you can model the variation like the correlation between multiple series like if they are related to each other if I understand correctly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a. a I, I'm going to give example about it in the in the coming slides. Um, like what you, it's not necessarily it's you have correlation, which not necessarily causality. You would the correlation is a function that you have like a proxy, and the proxy would be typically the weather. So let's go back to the example of electricity you can say that i know that this is a function of weather right uh or the gas natural gas we consume more in the winter um but it might be that i assume that south dakota is colder on the winter than uh, california um and it's very similar to north dakota or Minnesota or other states that I do that are in the kind of like in the same weather patterns. So I would set it as a cluster and look at at, at those as a similar um, modeling approach for this specific because I assume they are if one it's more like a think about like a transfer learning if it will work on one probably will work on the other. Um, that's one way to approach it. The other way, there is okay. models that can handle multi, like a multiple time series. It's called one example is VAR, uh, vector autoregressive, which assumes that the consumption of natural gas in, in I'm again, like I'm, I'm sticking to the this example, in North Dakota is similar to the consumption or in, in South. Not in the magnitude, but more as as the as the the patterns, right? We assume that in January they will the change between January and February will be same. So we can use the same weight and try to also understand the relationship. I the problem with it is it's limited to like also to scaling, and this is maybe where deep learning might have better performance because you can actually use multiple inputs and predict multiple outputs. I don't have experience with that, uh, but that's something that uh, can definitely be a solution uh, if you have enough data. Okay, okay, but, but, but the, the other question uh, was uh, as well, um, something that I'd be willing to know, is that a network uh, element uh, aspect of it, meaning a more realistic modeling, right? Uh, that, oh, there, there is this grid, and there are these relationships between these providers, and that's uh, is reflected uh, reflective in 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 the aggregate demand. Um, so you're talking about hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I n- not just hierarchy. I mean, like for example, there are, there are two things that you talked about here. One is uh, coordinates, right? Like and or proximity, latitude, longitude. Those are exogenous variables that could be used. Um, but my question is like, let's say there are four providers in the Northeast and it's a matter of mm, like bidding or con or, or some w- which influences the prices and that reflects in aggregate demand. That, yeah. that was more so the question. Yeah. And, 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 and I will, I will say that 
that's a good question in in forecasting there are sometimes uh like you have different levels and and where you want to land is where you can see the impact um that the in the case of natural gas that if the impact is derived by demand and not by let's say engineering decision or by maybe you have a specific problem provider that there is a, some limitation of how much capacity. Now you can back it in in the models. It's adding some complexity, but it won't reflect the, 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 like the signal. And so sometimes there is a trade-off when you say like, okay, I want to go to the point where I get the clean signal of the consumers as opposed to I'm meeting some barrier of uh, the ability to supply, which not represent patterns. And then I can apply some assumption about the supply constraint. That's one way to approach it. Or there is some models that you can back in constraints that you say, okay, I'm I'm expecting some growth, but I, I want to limit the growth. Uh, so I think it's a really you know depend on the business objective and the you know the problem that you are facing uh, but that's something typically i would prefer to go to the level that i get a clean signal and then if i need to break it down uh downstream i would apply some ass assumption about the distribution or something similar okay yeah that, that answers um yeah, i do not want to uh, take more time but just that is that a process? Because I, I read these local law 87, local law 97, all these state regulations, city regulations. Is there some sort of hybrid nat natural language processing and uh, time series forecasting that could be done that, you know what, if these regulations are enforcing 2024, 2026, 2029, 2034 deadlines, most likely it's going to be a gradual smooth decline of uh, corresponding demand and or energy efficiency. If energy efficiency goes down, then the the, uh, the the demand is going energy efficiency goes up uh, demand is going to go down yeah uh, i feel like this is very less like it's is is a for years this is area that very strong or started to develop first on the finance sector where i know they have friends that is working in hedge fund that they try to understand like translate sentiment analysis on impact on financial KPI like stocks. I am not familiar in in like, like traditional time series. I feel like that we are now entering to that everything is now uh, under the influence of LLMs. Uh, so we might see more. Um, I specifically, um, I'm not familiar with a specific use case that, uh, that require the use of a uh, uh, text to understand change in regulation. I feel like the the way the one that I'm familiar with is in finance, less in, in other area. Thanks, that that thanks, thanks. Awesome. So let me just uh go back. By the way, if you didn't watch this movie, uh, this is from the Anchorman, Will Ferrell. I highly recommend it. It's a uh, funny movie. All right, so we talked about all sourcing. Uh, we talked about more or less the, the, you know, the, the models that specifically I'm using here. Um, those are called traditional, but it's not limited for those models. So if you typically, as a data scientist, you would know uh, your data and you should explore it. If you don't know, understand what would work and then try to build different um, it's like building automatically, trying to kind of like uh, I identify most of the 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 scenarios that you might encounter with your data. You won't cover one hundred percent, but at least try to get the majority and apply it on like on all the series. So that's the idea of back of back testing with all tracing. And now we can start talk about uh, cluster, uh, which is, I remember that I was in, 
uh, a conference, uh, our studio conference, which today is called POSIT, but at the time it was like a pre-pandemic uh, in San Francisco. And I took the workshop with Professor Ob Inman. Uh, for those who are not familiar, he's one of the people, uh, the main people in the domain of forecasting. Uh, he wrote the forecast package and now it's moved to the Fibel. Um, and he came with this uh, idea of feature-based time series analysis, which again, like um, as we are moving from the, uh, the working with a limited number of time series to a scale, and um, the idea is that if you have many time series, uh, you can conduct some unsupervised learning, try to cluster your series, and uh, try to find similarities. So if you have, let's say, 200 time series or 1,000, you collapse each time series to a row using... Um, Feature. So you are taking each time series and you calculate some different matrices and you end up with a sing single row that represent uh, each series. And you build a table of features. Each row represents a time series. And then you conduct some unsupervised learning, like uh, principal component, uh, clustering, and so on. And from there, it's like uh, it's a, like any unsupervised. You're trying to understand what are the relationship between those series. Can you see clusters? Can you understand why they are clustered together, and so on? And this is an example that I took from um, Professor Inman uh, presentation. You have the link in uh, below, which he demonstrate how um, the process is done. So you are building you're collecting features, you're taking time series, you build features, you calculate different uh, metrics, and then you take those features, you get a table and you calculate, uh, in this case, principal uh, component, you are taking uh, the two main uh, principal com components and you're trying now to understand what's going on here. So in this case, um, here we see that it seems like there are three clusters using those colors and the color series representing the frequency. So some of the series here has a yearly frequency, uh, which is the, the dark purple. Um, the blue is representing quarterly and the yellow represents uh, monthly. So you can understand, I mean, this is very obvious, right? That you will have this pattern, but in other case, you might have other patterns. And here there is features that represent seasonality and this give you kind of like sense. It's a different clusters, right? You can see that the series that are below has more uh, seasonality patterns. This is the magnitude measure. And you can choose to maybe you can say, okay, I might apply different seasonality features for those series. Um, and again, like you can go you know, evaluate each feature. And the idea is that it's unsupervised. You need to figure out the relationship. Uh, there is, you need to use some data visualization um, and do some search and come with conclusions. Uh, that's a nice feature. I remember the first time I saw it, it was really like blow my mind because uh, this is can be used for also forecasting. If you identify you segment different cluster, um, and then you can apply some transfer learning that I will uh, talk in a second, uh, use to learn a specific uh, series and apply it for the rest. Um, and again, this, this is a great method to analyze your data in scale, but the, uh, the pitfalls of this um, method that you really need to identify what features will work and it's come with the, the the characteristic of unsupervised learning, which is it's a try and seek. It's unlike unlike a regression that you get like a a point estimate, and you can benchmark, you can measure it. Here, it's more open, uh, so it requires some more experience and interpretation of your results. 
Uh, but it's, uh, you know, that's a, I feel like it's a also great um, method to explore your data, understand how to approach it. I will pause here before going to the next method. See if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, Ramid, so the on the PC on the PC plot, each dot is a time series, right? Yes, exactly. So we are breaking down. We are, let, let's say we have time series, and we calculate the correlation of uh, the series with the twelfth leg and correlation the series with the um, you know twelfth leg if it's monthly. So we essentially will calculate the correlation with the seasonal. Um, leg and other legs there is some um there is a package that give you out of the box um uh, calculated tons of features um and the idea is those features has some information and you summarize at the end of the day you summarize each series you collapse it into a single row with uh, each each column represents some features and you want to identify the relationship between those features here it's using PCA, but there are other uh, unsupervised learning methods um, and or dimension reduction, but it's a kind of like give you directional where you want to start with. So that's one way to do it. And you can leverage what you learn here and um, use transfer learning. And I use transfer learning. I don't know if there is a, like, you know, you know, I'm using my own language. I don't know if there is like a better way to describe it because transfer learning is coming from deep learning in the context that you, for example, image recognition, um, you train, let's say you are Google or a big company, you have a resource, you train um, your, some model of image recognition of really huge data sets require big, um, computational resources and then you make this model uh, um, public and people can take it and with a either out of the box or fine tuning will use the learning from the other data that use on the training and apply it on their new data assuming that there is some similarity so let's say that the training that like you take a a in in image recognition, a model was trained to uh, identify dogs and cats, and your data is dog and cats. So most likely, this will work on your data because you have a similar data. If you have wolves, it might not work. Um, and then maybe you need to do some uh, additional tuning. So I use this term, but it's not 1%. Uh, I, I, I didn't have any other terms to use, so don't don't quote me in, in the... Uh, in, in this term that is like the official one or textbook, but that's like a, the idea here. And for example, I, I, I plot here on the right side um, two different uh, series. Uh, the one on the top is the consumption of natural gas by resid um, residents, consumers, and in the bottom is industrial uh, consumers. And you see like they have a um, each one has a similar patterns, like the consumers consume the same, like the same, they have a similar patterns. The trend seems like the same and similar for the industrial. Um, most of them are look alike. Um, so you, you're starting that you don't really need to do cluster because you see they are fairly similar. Maybe the magnitude is different, but um, you can assume that Maybe it's out of here, but if there is outlier in one, it might be applicable for the rest. So if you look very carefully on the upper side, in 2000, between 2015 and 2010, uh, 2013, there is a big spike. And the reason there was a spike, and I remember it because I was studying at that time at the University of Michigan, that was one of the coldest winter in the history of uh, North America. And you can see that the consumption uh, across all was high. So you don't really need to go series by series to flag it. You can say, okay, I see there was a pattern here. I can take one series. 
that I think that is representative of the cluster. You can do it one or multiple. This provide a good representative of the cluster. Um, analyze it, identify the features, build the features, um, and then apply it on the rest. So again, you can combine it with the all stressing uh, that enable you a little bit more freedom that might be uh, something that work on some specific uh, series might, might work less on others. So you want to have also diversity of models and that's like the, you know, enjoying both worlds. Uh, but the, the level of effort required to build features, and I didn't talk about it, but one of the challenging uh, or the time consuming in time series forecasting is the feature engineering. If you have like a time series data that is like very monotonic, you might get, get away of, of it with uh, successfully with just using out of the box time series models like Old Winter and Arima. But in other cases, you may need, uh, in real life uh, cases, you may need to build features because like COVID, right? You had structural break, things change, policy change, and so on. And this is where you need to spend a lot of time on features. And again, here, here, this is like the idea here is that you build features for one series, you can test it on, you know, a number of representative set of time series, see if it's working and then apply it on the rest. So it's again, save you a lot of time if you have hundreds of series. Um, where we can see it, for example, there was a good example of, uh, there was a competition, the M3. Um, there is the M competition, which is representative of uh, like it's a forecasting competition. Last year was the M5, I believe. The M3 or the M4 was uh, sales of uh, different products in Walmart across three states, California, Texas. And I forgot which one was the third, I believe it might be Arizona, but essentially think about thousands of products across different um different uh, uh, stores, different states. And you can think about strategy. Maybe you want to cluster it by state and product and apply, uh, you know, apply uh, your features based on this. Or you can say, I think that the consumption, the state doesn't really matter. And I can uh, build the features based on the products and assuming that people in California consume the same in Texas. And so on. So you can really um, come with your assumption and, and test them. Um, but that's the idea. Because like if you have thousands, you cannot really go and build features each one of for each one of those. And again, nothing is perfect. Uh, and the pitfalls, the main pitfalls of this approach is that you can uh, you might it might be challenging to find the, the series that really represent the rest. And maybe you need to, to, you definitely need to test it on multiple series and you might miss some of the series that might have some unique behavior, but because you cannot go check each one of those, uh, you miss them. Um, and again, that's more re like require additional testing and it's coming like if as you have more serious time series, you might find yourself spending more time if you really want to make it uh, accurate and providing like uh, achieving your business goals. And then um, I think when you're in the business, like I always remember the sentence that my stats professor used to tell us, statistician or said people, they know that they are wrong from the first place. So they go and measure it. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, you know, in machine learning or stats, you are really um, evaluate your performance on, you know, when you're modeling, you are always look at the performance. And when you are scaling, monitoring is a major factor. And generally monitoring in data science is I cannot say how much important it is to have monitoring. I think that uh, that's the last mile that usually most of us are at the point that you, you know, you're, you have already something, so you are skipping it. But I advocate 
don't skip it. Uh, it's super important, especially when you are uh, trying to scale. Because once you scale, you build some models, you might be wrong, and most likely you're wrong. The question is how wrong you are. And you, the idea of monitoring is to um, identify problem before when they are small, before they are starting to become big. So once you deploy your forecast, um, you want each time that you get a new data a realization of the actuals to compare with your forecast and measure uh, the performance with some defined KPIs. And you want to alert whenever you see outliers. And this is where maybe you can do it when you have like a sig uh, by yourself, when you have a, like be a human monitoring when you have a single uh, time series, but at the scale it won't work. So you really want to apply some automation and measure it whenever you your pipeline, data pipeline refresh also to calculate those uh, KPIs and identify uh, whenever you have performance drift or outliers. Um, very important is to do post-mortem analysis. So let's say that you have a cadence of forecasting. Let's say that every month you refresh your forecast, you're doing forecast for the next uh, um, couple of quarters or couple of weeks, depending on the context. And whenever um, you finish the cycle of the forecast, meaning that uh, you forecast, let's say, at the beginning of the year, then until the end of the year, and at the end of the year, you uh, have all the actuals. It's time to go and see how well the forecast work um, to identify if there are areas that you can improve. Um, and that's very important uh, when you're doing post-mortem analysis is to feedback the learning that you learn. And this is how you keep the, um, this is like the last layer that enable you to keep the scaling of those models and keep them in fit, good fit, and you can continue use them. Or maybe adjust whenever you see something is not working. And I will pause here uh, to see if there are any questions. I have a question. Um, I, I think there's a question online, uh, Rami. I think the question was, what is probabilistic forecasting and what applications is it preferred? I think it's in the chat. And okay. the second question is, are there any, well, go ahead. A probabilistic forecasting um, essentially is um, typically it's related to Bayesian approach where you, uh, it's a way to, you know, when you get a forecast, you get a point estimate, but um, I always, you know, I'm especially when working in a business environment, communicate only point estimate is, I feel like it's, it's something as a data scientist you should not do because point estimate, it's the mean. But it doesn't mean that your actuals will be close to the mean and there are other options, right? And this is where there are different approach of like how you look at probabilistic, but in the traditional stats, you get uh, prediction intervals, which saying, let's say that you are um, using a 95 uh, prediction intervals, which the within this this prediction intervals, uh, just say that the, there is 95 percent chance that the actual value will be within the this range. Um, so that's one way to look at probabilistic, and there is the Bayesian approach, which is saying that like um, we calculate different paths, and each one has some probabilistic uh, to occur. And we combine all of them, and then you can calculate quantile and so on. But the idea is that there is no point estimate; there is a range, and this gives you the range. And the question: How how certain you want to be in this range? Like, is if it will be, let's say, as you go higher, between let's say between eighty percent to ninety percent or ninety nine, uh, the range will become wider. So that's a that's kind of like. Probabilistic, 
uh, approach. There is um, now it's something you know very popular. Uh, I forgot how it's called conformal uh, intervals, which is I talked about traditional time series statistical models, which come with a point estimate and some information about the distribution of the point estimate, so we can calculate the probability of the range, like the um, the prediction intervals and so on. But machine learning models, they give you one point. Some of them or most of them, you will get estimate of some point without the probability. There is no distribution. And this is where the use case of, uh, there are different approaches. One of those is con conformal uh, intervals, which trying to learn the distribution of the error and apply range. I hope this is answer. This was long answer for short questions. Yeah. Hi, Rami. I had one from the class here. Um, so for like, you were talking about having to observe multiple different time series objects before. Why don't you use a deep learning model just to do the automatic feature selection and then employ some sort of like recurrent, like an LSTM or GRU and just have that automated? Is there some specific nuances that uh, you could highlight that why you would not just do that in most, most cases? Um, I would say that deep learning um, to work well require a lot of features. Um, so if you are coming with monthly, and also it's coming with high computational cost. So you always have to ask yourself, do I have enough features that I can create for my time series that justify the use of time series? Can it beat like linear regression? That's the first thing, question. So like if it, if it does, yes, go ahead and use uh, deep learning where they will be probably performing better than traditional time series is when you have high frequency of time series, uh, like a, let's say hourly or even more granular time series of quote, like a 15 minutes intervals, minute or seconds, where the amount of features that you can create is really exponential and the traditional time series won't be able to handle it. And this is where I would try to go to those models. So I guess like the, the short answer is like, it depends on the use case. If you think like uh, that deep learning will work better for you, you should, you should definitely use it. If you think that it, um, the cost benefit of using it won't really uh, efficient. So use something else. Any other question from this room? There's a quite a few questions online. Uh, Ramiro, can you hear uh, me? Let me? So let me try to stop sharing and-, and... Yeah. Get to the chat and I can. You can see the chat, right? I, I lost my mom, my mouse. So I'm trying to get to the chat. Let's see if I can escape, maybe. I can read if you want. I can read the question to you if you want. Yeah, if you can do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll read uh, this. Um, if you, if you, in your horse racing part, do you automate the hyperparameter tuning process for all different time series? to ensure scaling. For example, the difference values for Arima to make your time series stationary, was this determined behind the scenes of the algorithm or did you decide a mm -hmm. default value yourself? Yeah, typically you would come with some assumption about the structure of the data and you make a decision based on this, um, what approaches use again like going back to the previous question if you're coming with assumption that um you have a granular data and you think that deep learning or machine learning like sg boost will be because you have many features or you want to generate more features um so the assumption is that you are coming with some prior about your data and then you will try what you feel that it's best for this data and the example that i showed i think it's also um it was a gas, natural gas consumption, and it's a monthly. So I just went, it was just for the example, for the sake of the example, I used traditional time series, which uh, typically will be really good uh, for this type of data. But I think that's like a judgment call that, uh, that the, the, the data scientist should, 
should uh, apply. Okay, we have quite a few questions. So the second question, I'm going to go from the top. Are there any good approaches for good feature selection for time series? Yes. Um, one way to that I like to do is that when I'm looking at the new time series, I use the decomposition that I showed before, the STL, and I'm looking at the reminder. As I mentioned before, the reminders give you a reflection of, is, is it white noise, meaning that the seasonal component and the trend are reflecting all the information or there's something left? It's like residual analysis. And if there are patterns still left there, so it means that you need some features. So typically I'm calculating uh, the stand deviation of the reminder and I um, plot I mark the, those stand deviation if it's above two or three, I will mark it on the actual series and it's give you a quick um, way to look of where, where should I start to look at? Because uh, you would, in most often you will either have outliers, let's say in the case of gas consumption, there was winter that had uh, cold winter that uh, people consume more. But it doesn't really represent the, you know, the average. So you want to remove the the impact, and this is one way to do it. Another way uh, is when you're creating a forecast is to go look at the residuals, and then you can apply back the same method, like calculate the standard deviation. You can automate it and say that I'm creating features. Uh, you can say like uh, some range, so if it's between two to three, it's a uh, mild. If it's above three, it's a uh, extreme. And I'm segmenting those two as uh, features uh, and apply it back to the model. You should be very careful with this because sometimes like it's, it might be reoccurring events and it may be, if it's occurring, it's very hard to, if you automate it, it's very hard to understand if it's just outlier or reoccurring and then you miss it in the future. Um, so you, again, this is the monitoring, right? So after you apply it, you might find out that, oh, I see it again and I see it in the same range of dates. Maybe it's a reoccurring. Um, I should go speak. Typically you work with some business partner and get more context. Um, so this, this is two approaches that I'm using to automate. Um, and then other features like there is the, uh, if you really want to use regression, um, you know, you can build it from scratch, uh, build like the trend, you can apply um, different as complex, you can go as complex as like using splines and other features. The automation is the tricky part uh, because um, you, in time series, what is true now might not reflect in the future and you need to be careful. You should come with some assumptions and make sure that test those assumptions before automating it. Okay, there's two related questions here. So the first is how do you maintain multiple models when you have to manage so many different forecasts, how often do you review and evaluate, evaluate them? And the related question is, how do you tune the hyperparameter for tens of thousands of models? Um, uh, every model is, you know, is um, when it scales up. So it's yeah. a true related question. Um, so let's start with the last question. Um, if you, for example, you are using some machine learning model, uh, you will spend a lot of time on on the tuning. Um, so one approach is like uh, the transfer learning. I'm starting uh, with some grid search, let's say XCBoost. I'm I see that all the series kind of like have uh, some uh, similarity. So I will take one representative. I will spend a lot of time on tuning really well, identify the parameters of the XCBoost, what the uh, um, values to use on you know the range of value i will narrow it down to really small value and then i can apply really um get some dedicated range or small range and apply it on the rest so instead of spending long time on each series you apply it on one but then you 
narrow the grid or just say I'm I'm okay with what I found for this series and that's what I'm using for the rest. And that's just the tuning. And then you need to um, recalibrate the, the, the weights that the model calculate. So it's one thing that like the parameters, but then like you want to uh, see if, let's say that you train an XG boost, you start to, to forecast, let like you're doing a daily forecast of the weather and um, every 24 hours you're creating this forecast and you, you're you okay with the tuning, right? So you tune it, uh, you just refit every time you get new data, but the mon- this is where the monitoring is coming into place where you want to uh, check if you have a drift in the performance. So let's say that you train it and you, on average, the error rate on the testing partition was 5%. And when you are forecasting, when you get a realization of your actuals, you see that you are around this range. So that's fine. But if you start to see a trend that your error rate on average going up, let's say to six or seven, maybe it's time to go and do recalibration of the models. A question from the audience here. So there's one more uh, online question, Rami, but I'll ask a very general question uh, first. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how to be, how is it's like to be working at Apple? Do you get free iPhones or what? Um, and secondly, uh, anything in data science in general, you know, how about what kind of job or projects you guys do in Apple and um, and and also data science job market in general. Thank you. Yeah, so I was I would say that I cannot I promise to my you know uh, to our legal team that's like the condition any anytime I'm going to to a talk uh, that I'm uh, uh, I'm just talking about the uh, time series and not about my work. I can say that the only thing I can say yes I'm getting iPhone uh, and other uh, Apple products. Uh, so that's a I would, let, let me summarize this. It's a great company to work at. at um, I'm at the six years over here and I'm really enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, beyond this, I I prefer, not, especially we are recording, so I prefer not to uh, to continue to talk about it. Okay, thank um, you. As a data, I, I just have a follow up there. Uh, why was the, uh, the, the, the CD disturbing you in between the calls? That's uh, that's a pertinent question. That you. Because I have multiple devices and I have a uh, accent, and I think sometimes the accent uh, triggers it. I was meant as a joke. Oh. Yeah, I I I love Siri, but sometimes. Uh, yeah. No, it was meant as a joke. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I got it. Anything you want to mention, Rami? Um, data science job market in general um that you know how uh, yeah yeah um i can say like for, you know um i feel like data science market today those days are tough because we are after a tough year um like the, the economy Seems like that there is slow down. Uh, there were uh, many companies around here at a, a layoff, uh, or companies stop hiring. So you are, unfortunately, if you are graduating today, you are going to a tough market, which is more competitive. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that. The, you know, it, if there is a, a area that will continue to be growing, or at least I hope I'm biased, but it's data science. So if you're in data science, you are probably have more chance to find job than other area. Uh, there are areas that are more uh, all today, like the all the NLP and LLMs. This is today like the, you know, uh, if you're not there, you're not exist. Uh, I feel like as someone doing time series that like now it's boring 
uh, to do time series. Uh, uh, but here is the advice that I can give you as someone that was on your shoes a few years ago. And I feel like when I went to the job market, I was like uh, completely shocked or not ready. Um, is that it's a competitive market as you can come ready to this market with, um, you know, beyond theoretical knowledge, you will have better chance to find faster or your your process of finding job will be faster. Uh, what does it mean? I can give you an example that as a student, I spend most of the time besides studying on trying to find practical jobs in the university as a research scientist because I understood that I need to learn programming. So by the time that I graduate, I really, at that time, today it seems like crap, but at that time I had a good programming skills uh, compared to my peers. And that was really helped me to find my first job. Um, so I recommend use every moment that you have um, to build those skills. Go check potential jobs that you are interested um, and identify the skills, the job, the, what, you know, the main skills that require for when you're, you know, joining after school. I can tell you that probably you need to know Python. Uh, you need to know SQL uh, or R or, you know, programming language. To, it's better to know one or two programming language at a, a decent level than trying to learn many different skills. Um, I'm sure that you are going with knowledge, theoretical knowledge, but you should try to, to get as much as practical. Go find like a nice project, build stuff. Um, there are good resources there. Uh, learning is not going to end as a data scientist. It's not going to end when you're graduating. Um, when you, I, yeah, I feel like that when you find your first job, you will feel like that people continue to learning. I'm still spending every week a few hours on uh, when I have time on reading and learning um, new stuff. There are good resources out there on YouTube. Take advantage on those, but really come with a practical experience as much as you can. That will give you some advantage when you, before you go into the job market. I just for those who are here today, uh, Rami released uh, a uh, all the material he used for today's talk. All his code is on GitHub. I think uh, if you receive the email from uh, the notification, you can find uh, the link to Rami's uh, LinkedIn page. From here, I think he twisted he, he posted his uh, link to the GitHub uh, page. If you couldn't find it, uh, you can email me. If you're online, I already sent that out. I think that is exactly as Remy said, he's doing a lot of free seminars like this. He's doing two tutorials, um, a lot of cool examples online. They have hundreds of over 100,000 followers on, on LinkedIn. He's just educating lots of people online. Other questions from questions? From the students, any other questions, guys? You have the mic ready? And one last question online, uh, Remy. Um, how do global models work like modeling a thousand time series using a single XG boost or light GBM, light BM model? It really depends on, on the type of data that you have. I believe that this is why I like a the horse racing that if you have intuition that the exibus will the model for you um you can go and test it it will come with some competition cost but there is no like a a, sing, a single uh or silver bullet right it will work for all. there are some cases i think the rule of form for me is as your frequency of your data is higher meaning that you have more granularity you will more the machine learning models will work better like XGBoost but you you know the burden of proof is on the model you want to test it you don't want to take it for granted that XGBoost will work better um, 
and there is like computational cost. So you need to be aware. I always say, you know, when I see, when I talk with other people that develop uh, uh, packages for time series, and today the trend is to go to the machine learning models, mainly in Python, that when you are creating some leaderboard, you should also include the uh, the compute time. Uh, and you should think if moving from linear regression that it takes like a fraction of seconds to less than a fraction of seconds to run, uh, if XGBoost provide you a lift in the performance, what would be the cost, the alternative cost uh, that it worth to go and spend, let's say, five minutes compared to a fraction of seconds to train the model? Does it worth like improve of, I know, a fraction of percentage or where where is like worth to go invest this resource? Like I think that once you start to work in enterprise, you also start to think about the cost. Uh, there is a cost. There is also um, environmental cost. Um, so you should be minded, right? If you are, as a young data scientist, my, when I started, uh, I was running to the Exibus, to the uh, deep learning. This is, was like a really exciting and it was fun. I still use some of those. Uh, but as you get more mature, you start to look at also, you know, cost benefits and uh, something that are more down to earth. And in some cases, if it's improving by 1%, like let's say from four to five, but it costs me X amount of not only the time, but also the compute power, I would think twice before I will go and use it at a scale. So I think those are kind of like the, what you need to think. But again, like there is no one model for. Yeah, I have... Rami, wonderful talk. Uh, Thank you. I hardly understood anything because I'm from a different field altogether. So we do fluid mechanics modeling, but maybe I did understand something, but uh, that's why I have a question. So. We do a lot of computational modeling. So as in, we can um, we can extract uh, very complex geometries and we can run simulations to track the flow or different constituent transport in that in that uh, model. And we can synthetic uh, artificially generate the time series data for any parameter within that domain. And uh, it might be as nuanced as some of the plots that you have shown as well. Uh, my vague question is, have you come across any kind of work where the latest models are being used to understand more about CFD data in, in, in uh, biological systems? Um, I'm not familiar with this domain. I actually, someone reached out to me from Brazil a few weeks ago about question about it. Um, about uh it's a time series but it's more like a panel data um which it's a completely different modeling um than like traditional time series uh so the short answer i'm not unfortunately i'm not familiar with spe this specific domain it's a little bit different I, I believe like it's a if i'm correct it's more like a panel data uh, yeah, I mean, there would be some kind of order on the data rather than it being rather random. Uh, from yes, my there's a mix effect, right? Um, yeah. yeah, and yeah, that's a. Unfortunately, it's a. I mean, it's a definitely interesting topic. Unfortunately, I never had a chance to uh, work with uh, this type of setting. Uh, time series is like um, when you say time series, it's a or you know there's generic. Um, what does it mean time series, but it's also typically referred to regular time series, which is mean that it's a space equally. Um, and this is, this is the major when people refer to time series and forecasting, they refer to regular time series, but there is irregular time series, which is a whole different world and interesting world. 
and there is also panel data which you know, like uh, you have a uh, it could be patient or you know some experiments or uh, DNA and st other stuff that uh, you have some relationship between those uh, time series and and this is completely different modeling uh, approaches. Sorry, I cannot answer. No, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Thanks. Thank you. Question from your students. One last question, Rami. Sorry, I'm asking so many questions. Thinking about AI, chat GPT, and large language models, um, from a data science job market perspective, I mean, uh, so how does that impact that or the work that we're going to do in the near future? if this language model can write code and how does that do to jobs in terms of? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an answer. I feel like it's a, uh, I think at this point it's, it's amazing what you can do with this, but also it's um, still not, uh, can write by itself code. Uh, I would say that you need to think about it as like the revolution in computer science that uh, every few years you have like a really, you know, him change in the way that people are using computers. At the beginning, people used um, the machine language, right? You used to talk with the chips, uh, with the programming language like a assembler, uh, where you would really speak with the chip. And then some folks came and created C and C++, where it's like a upper level language that is more friendly, um, that uh, enable to perform uh, the same task, but in more efficient. Um, and down the road came programming language, the upper layer programming language that are more simple to use, like Python, uh, that are more friendly and more efficient that using on 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 under the hood, they're using Fortran or C plus plus or C to the performance. So I think that's the next layer that we will use those language model to generate the code for us. And I believe in the next few years, the way that we are writing code will change. But still going to be people requiring to write code. It just will be different, and the productivity will increase. So will someone say it and think all people are repeating? Uh, it's not that it's going to replace you. What will replace you is someone that's using it. So you should use it. Any other questions, guys? Hey, Rami, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, um, so I got a quick question about... Um, you talked about you have experience in R and a little bit in Python as well. Um, when it comes to getting a job um, early on, if you have more experience in one than the other, how do you handle um, like the flexibility of maybe learning the other one or that sort of situation? Any advice on that? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say, like, let's say like, if you're going to job market, Python, you know, it's the main language. And if you're not using it, it's better to learn Python. I'm, I'm a R user, but I mean, I'm honest here that saying that uh, if I would you, um, you know, you better, um, the, again, depending on the use case, right? In time series, uh, R is still like, a, has a lot of application and statistical R is, is the best language. Uh, in other area, more jobs are available on Python. So this is a consideration that I would I would think. If you have one over the other, you should ask yourself how many jobs on the market require this language? Is it the majority? And if not, you should think if you want to be in the niche or you want to... There are some advantages being on the niche and like you know, people using our, our the niche. Uh, and there are some great stuff without it still not available in Python, but I think over the years, they are kind of like catch up with each other. So, but the problem is that uh, 
if you're joining company that most of people are using Python and you're coming and using R, it will be very hard to collaborate. It's a chicken egg problem. So I would that's like a, what I would look at. How many jobs on the market? If you maybe I mean it's sometimes early at this point to identify what you want to do when you grow up, but if you know what you want to do and you go and you can check in what are the job markets in this uh, area and, and what are the programming language asking. And you should ask yourself if you have the right language or not. If you are, so probably you should go and be better. And if not, uh, maybe you should start to think if like if you want to converge to and learn the other programming language. Flipping between programming language is not that hard. If you have the foundation, it's straightforward. Just require like learning a new language, right? If you I know speak Italian, it's might be I'm making some assumption that I, I I I'm not sure about it, but might be easy to learn Spanish or the opposite around because there are some correlation. So I think that's like the kind of like R and Python. They are very similar in many things and difference in others. So it's a long answer for a short question, but I would check. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Rami, um, uh, for your time and for your wonderful seminar. And then this, I think I recorded the video. So the video is going to be posted on YouTube, uh, too, if you have friends that want to watch this later, right? So Rami is that kind of person, open up everything. You see it open. Thank you very much, uh, Rami. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And good luck. Thank you. Thank you. We still have some pizza, guys.